Praise the Lord and welcome. Welcome to today's edition of the State of the Union, our series of daily broadcasts in which we look at issues pertaining to the word of the Lord saying, tell my people to return to me. Tell my people to return to me. And we have been about this pursuing the matter perhaps from two different directions. What have we done about which God is saying return? How have we walked away? How have we turned away? How have we slackened? How have we become distracted? What has captured our attention away from God? For which he may be saying, tell my people to return to me. Now the other dimension is the business of, let's call it reward reward. What do I stand to benefit? What do I stand to benefit in returning? Why is God asking me to return at this time? Why didn't he say this 10 years ago? Why isn't he saying it 10 years hence? Why now? What is so critical about now? Whenever you may be receiving this. This is January 2023. Even if you get to see this five years from now, that will be your now. Why is God getting you to hear this now? For one, there is the matter of a possible judgment that is at hand. God has indeed promised through the scriptures to recompense men for their deeds. Good for good deeds, evil for evil deeds. Perhaps he's asking us to return as a last ditch effort to save us from that judgment, especially the judgment for evil. But then there is the wrath of God that is revealed unto the disobedient, the children of disobedience. You know, part of turning away from God and turning to perhaps walking by flesh or walking by the sight or walking by the wisdom of the world amounts to a disobedience of sorts because he says to walk by the spirit. He says to no man after, no, no man after the flesh. So when we walk any other way but the spirit of God, we are in disobedience. Never mind that we are children of God. We are in disobedience all the same. Now, if a so-called wrath of God has already been revealed in the direction of the children of disobedience, now you don't want to be frolicking with their own judgment. Now, in the past couple of days, we have been looking at a certain matter from James chapter 4. And yesterday we saw that this matter has perhaps four component parts. So it says from James chapter 4 verse 7, it says, Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Then verse 8 says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Verse 9 says, be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. And verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the sight of God and 
he shall lift you up. So perhaps there is a lifting up that is our foot. And God is asking us to return in submitting our, or humbling ourselves to him so that we can be partakers of that lifting up. Not just to avoid the judgment, but perhaps to participate in the lifting up. Then, of course, is the matter of Jesus is coming. So this may just be God rallying his troops around himself. Rallying his troops back home for the airlift. For the airlift out of the earth, as it were. Now, but this portion of scripture gives us four different dimensions of action and all of them are directed at us. And yesterday we looked at humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and we saw the example of our Lord Jesus who became a servant and became obedient unto death. Today, let us consider the issue from James chapter 4, verse 8. And it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. And straight away, the scripture gives us three different parameters three different areas of effort by which we may draw near to God. There are others, but straight away it gives us three. It says, cleanse your hands. Of course, your hands will always refer to your works, that which you do. And then it says, purify your hearts. you double-minded. Cleanse your hearts, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. How, by, by, by what will a man cleanse his way? Except that he orders his steps by the word of the Lord. And how will you purify your hearts? Jesus said, sanctify them by your word, for your word is truth. And Psalm 119 verse 60 or thereabouts says, 160 says, the sum total of your word is truth. So when Jesus said, sanctify them, he gave the formula by your word. Your word is truth. So David said, I have hidden your word in my heart. And your word gives me counsel from my heart. So when you begin to fill up your heart with the word of God, a purification process begins. And give you a practical example, or if you like, a leg, a, a, the allegory, a practical parallel. Now, imagine you have some detergent in a cup, and you place the cup under running water. Now, what's going to happen? As the water hits the detergent in the cup, we know the effect. Now, as you allow the water and the cup to continue in that relationship, as the cup begins to fill up to the brim and begins to run over, the concentration of that detergent in the cup begins to decrease and decrease and decrease as you lose more and more of that detergent as the water runs over. 
that if you leave it for long enough, you soon get clean water from the cup. No detergent. Now, if we take the detergent to be the evil in our hearts, for example, as you begin to purify your heart with the water of the word of God, with the washing of the water of the word of God, as you begin to purify your heart with the washing of the water of the word of God, or as you begin to permeate, fill up your heart with the water of the word of God, it starts to purify your heart. Now, God is not going to fill up your heart with his word. He says, purify your heart. So that's an action we will have to take ourselves. But then he says, cleanse your hands. The cleansing tool of God is always going to be something about his word. It's always going to be something by his word. But I said, these are just two ways by which we can draw near to God. Purify your hands by reason of the word which you allow to order your steps. And purify your heart by the same word of God you allow to reside in your heart. And that's going to happen purely by reason of meditation. How long do you stay on the word? I am not talking about how long do you stay reading the Bible. Not that. That's good, but not that. How long do you stay on a word of God, perhaps from the scriptures, as you think on it, as you meditate on it, as you roll it around in your mind? Or does it just hit you and you go on to something else? Or, the, or does the word of God hit you and then you settle down and perhaps you write it down and you begin to pour over it and you begin to say it to yourself. You begin to speak it to yourself. You are thinking it, you are, you are, you are, you are, you are exercising yourself in that word. Now as you do that, the word of God begins to sink further and further into your heart. So there will come a time in the future that you will need that word and the Holy Spirit will just eject that word from your heart into your mouth and you'll be speaking the word of God. I said eject. I don't mean remove as in to throw away. It will shoot out that word from your heart and it comes out of your mouth and even you will wonder, I didn't know it was there. Where did that come from? That's because at some point in the past, you have meditated on that word. You have spent some time on that word, and now it is in your heart, waiting for a time that you will need it. But it says, tell my people to return to me. Here it says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. I'm sure we know that the distance between any, or the distance between any two objects is the same. Or let me put it in mathematical language. Any two objects, any two stationary objects are equidistant. Now, if one of those objects start to move in the direction of the other object, what happens to the distance between the two? It starts to decrease. So as one moves nearer the other, the other seems to be coming nearer the one that is moving. So if you stay your distance, the distance remains. But as we begin to move closer to God, we get the experience of God coming closer. Now, if God is a consuming fire, as you get closer to God, you start to feel the heat. And that heat starts to burn off dross from your life. But not just that, the heat also gives us some kind of warmth by the presence of God. The heat is also going to light up. Now, but the thing is, it says, draw near to God. Now, how are we likely to be able to draw near to God? Because God says, tell my people to return to me. So we must know the how. How are we going to draw near? We already saw two. Cleanse your hands. That is, look at your works. 
And then it says, purify your hearts. Both come by reason of the word of God anyway. How much time do you spend with God's word? I mean the written word. Now, let's not go racing down the road trying to read the Bible in one day. That's not the point. But really, anyway, how much time do you spend on the word of God? Because the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 3, 18, as you gaze upon the thing, you are changed to the image of that thing from glory to glory. So the more time you spend looking at, reading the word, meditating on the word, thinking on it, you are changed gradually from glory to glory into what that word says. So very soon, the position of that word will simply be what you are doing. So one way to draw near to God is by drawing near him through his word, through his written word. But then there is another. There is another. Let's call it communion, the communion of the spirit. This is spirit to spirit, deep calling to deep, the fellowship of the spirit. The more we fellowship with the spirit, the more it will seem that we are closer to God. I'll tell you my personal experience. A long time ago, my pastor and I were just having a conversation on the scriptures. I was nowhere near being a pastor then. He was already a pastor. He was my house fellowship pastor, as we say. And we we're just talking on the word of the Lord. We were talking around this particular scripture where Paul said, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. And we wondered between ourselves, how can Paul make such a boast? What, is the, what could he possibly be doing that made him so confident that he was speaking more than whoever else. And we came to this conclusion. At least that was our understanding in 1993 when this happened. We came to the conclusion that Paul must have been speaking in tongues at the highest possible limit, which is 24 hours a day. Right or wrong, that was our conclusion. That that's the only way he can say I speak in tongues more than all of you. He must have. How, how else can you be so certain? Do you know what somebody else is doing in his house? Unless, of course, if you are doing the ultimate, which is 24 hours a day. So we decided between ourselves to at least equal Paul. So we said we were going to be speaking in tongues 24 hours a day. That would be, of course, if we were not using our mouths to do something else, like to eat, or if you are sleeping, or if you really have to talk to somebody else. So I'm walking down the street <coughs> and I'm speaking in tongues quietly to myself. And when I'm among people, I use my hand to cover my lips as I speak in tongues. I'm in a public transport, I cover my mouth and I'm speaking in tongues. And on my bed, trying to get some rest, I'm speaking in tongues until sleep envelops me. I'm trying to do this for as many hours in a day as I possibly can when I'm not using my hand, my mouth for some other legitimate thing. I'm not sure, what, I don't know what happened to him, but I know what happened to me. As I began to do this, the first thing I noticed the tongues began to change. They began to vary. From mama, 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 it turned to something else, it turned to something else. Besides varying, it began to be deeper. It began to sound like bulldozers or bull boulders were falling on the ground. 
it began to be heavy. Now, those are, if you like, uh, my judgment. But I began to notice changes. I began to notice changes even in my prayer life. I began to notice changes in my sensitivity to God. Every little thing began to matter to me. And then I began to receive downloads from heaven. I would just be sitting idly by, quietly speaking in tongues, and my heart would just receive understanding of one scripture or the other. And within six months of doing this, I received by a direct download enough material to commit into writing, and it became my first book, The Holy Spirit Between Me and Jesus. That was the title. The Holy Spirit between me and Jesus. I began to have experiences. I began to have spiritual encounters, divine encounters. It was at this period I had my first encounter with the devil. And after the encounter, I had to ask the Holy Spirit, what did I do or not do which occasioned what just happened? And he said to me, didn't you say you want to serve Jesus? I said, yes. He said, well then, I have to give you experiences in the spirit so you know that the realm of the spirit is real. So I, all I can say is let no one deceive you about the devil, whether or not he exists. He does. And not just me, but I've met him. I've encountered him. Others have. But it's enough that the Bible speaks about the devil. So I was saying, so we began to speak in tongues. And all these things began to happen to me. And then the gifts of the Spirit began to just manifest. The gifts of the Spirit began to manifest. The love of the Lord was not far from my heart. And it was almost becoming like I was about to disappear from the earth. I would say I was becoming too spiritual for my liking. Even to eat, I couldn't dare eat heavy food because he would soon tell me, why did you order such heavy food? Is it not because you are beginning to depend on food rather than depending on me to keep you going? He began to teach me things. The more I did this, the closer it seemed that God became to me. The, re the more, the, how do you say this? The real or the more real he became. And his word began to come out of my mouth. The word began to come out of my mouth. And then it began to affect my immediate environment. And people began to notice the change. And they began to call me that famous appellation that we call preachers, man of God. When I was nowhere near a man in God, I was just a boy. But people around me began to call me man of God because they were beginning to see the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit coming out of my mouth. I was growing. I didn't even know what was happening to me, but I began to grow. I began to grow. Let's call that prayer. Let's call the other one reading the word. Let's call the other one meditating on the word. Let's call it spending time with God. So can I ask you a question? When was the last time you spent just an hour with the Lord? One hour. Okay, 30 minutes. Okay, you are in a hurry to go to work. You woke up late. 30 minutes. I didn't say 30 minutes to read your Bible. I said with the Lord. Just close the Bible. Just sit down. Lord, I just came to spend some time with you. Shut your mouth and sit down. And let him just enjoy your presence. You are drawing near to him. A lot of us started like that. But you see, the cares of this life, as our responsibilities grew, the pressure on our time also grew and we dropped off on those things. And then we became professional administrators as administration in our work, in our past, in pastoring. All these things began to take our time. And the next thing you know, you begin to feel dry. Because now God seems far away. You are working for him, but your relationship with him, there's a strain. So perhaps it is to somebody like that that this word is coming. Tell my people to return to me. 
perhaps the problem is that you have spread yourself so thin there's a strain on your connection with the head he says come back so that you can be refreshed and restored in that connection not in your knowledge of scripture not in your knowledge of, of, of ministry things just in the relationship he said draw near to me and draw near to God and he will draw near to you you see when the scripture says draw near to God and we draw near to you we have to take time to examine our way how have I walked away from him why do I need to draw near now for some of us it is not that we are far away it's just that God wants you nearer still have you been experiencing periods of seeming darkness in your life periods when it seems like God is far away where it seems like no fresh word is coming or has come to you where it seems like you are just alone you cannot in quote feel the presence of God periods or episodes of seeming darkness there is a reason for that I'll give you one I have at least about four different reasons but there is a one reason for that which is which which is pertinent here sometimes God hides he, he seems to withdraw from us because he wants us to seek him the more he wants us to get out of our comfort in our knowledge of him and do more and do more and do more reach out for him some more that may be increase in some area of whatever it is you are doing in his direction he just wants you to do more he says tell my people to return to me tell my people to return to me you have heard the word perhaps this is for you are you experiencing darkness that may just be God seeking to draw you out so that you can seek him more maybe in prayer maybe in the place of exercising yourself in speaking in tongues you know what Jude 20 says edifying yourself praying in the spirit so there is a growth factor attached to praying in the spirit and you know that growth carries its own challenge it forces you away from what you are used to to a new dimension tell my people to return to me can just so very easily be an invitation to a new dimension of experience well god bless you i have to end this time is up but i'll see you again on this same series of daily broadcasts tomorrow and we'll pick it up from there by the grace of God. God bless you.